rock music. Yeah, it's loud. It's all electric guitars. And drums. And high pitch singing. And bad facial hair. And occasionally, to be fair, sometimes good facial hair. But it's not just that. There are loads of artists that we would recognise as rock music that aren't just skinny British dudes from the 70s who play power chords, love the minor pentatonic scale, and have a bad heroin habit. Is there such a thing as a good heroin habit? As a genre, it covers a lot. Everything from the likes of Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath to The Beatles, The Smiths, The Talking Heads. Yes, King Crimson, Frank Zappa, U2, The Red Hot Chili Peppers, Oasis, Radiohead, The Doors, Heart, Credence Clearwater Revival, Kings of Leon, The Killers, Santana, Jimi Hendrix, Fleetwood Mac, Henry Cow, Polyphia, The Soft Machine, and even a fair bit of Funkadelic, Parliament, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Chicago and Steely Dan can all be called either rock or rock adjacent. There's obviously far more than I ever would have time to mention here, but the point is that rock is a very broad genre. So what is it that really makes rock music rock? The artists I just mentioned are all very different after all. Can one term really be applied to sort of diverse arrangements musicians meaningfully and why are they rock rather than pop or blues or anything else where are the lines between rock and its related genres and in fact let's be real let's face it isn't rock music dead now wasn't it all but killed off like a decade ago by rap and r&b isn't it just now an all but commercially irrelevant zombified corpse of a genre a mere shadow of its former glory all these questions, and many more, will be raised and then left unanswered in two frustratingly obtuse and badly edited videos. So let's try to define rock music a little bit and let's keep it simple for now. Isn't rock music when we really strip it back, just power chords played loudly on a guitar through an electric amp? Because it kind of is just that. If I had to sum up rock music in just one sentence, though it's not like anyone is making me, that's probably what I'd say. Again, power chords played loudly on a guitar through an electric amp. The electric guitar is, after all, the single most iconic rock thing imaginable it sums up a large part of the history <coughs> it sums up a large part of the history sound image culture and social impact of rock music and i think that alone covers morning number pulled completely out of thin air i think that alone covers around 70 percent of rock music's generic tropes and conventions blues rock hard rock punk rock grunge rock heavy metal prog rock glam rock post rock pop rock jazz rock even sedimentary rock. <laughs> Doesn't matter what type of rock it is, it all comes back to the electric guitar. Its sound, its image, and its sex appeal. But, well, as I just said, I'm not actually obliged to sum up the entire rock genre in just one sentence. And also, no single sentence is ever really going to do it all justice. I'm still going to work from this initial statement, though. At the very least, we can use it as a starting point to discuss the history of rock music. And through it, delve into some of those deeper questions about what genre is generally and what rock music is specifically. While asking ourselves what else we need to think about when looking at rock music or any genre. So, here we go. Power chords played loudly on an electric guitar through an electric amp. So, the mighty power chord. We all know it, we all love it. Okay, some people don't love it. Jazz guitarists. Ugh. But cool people do. At its most basic, it's just a root note with a fifth above it, sometimes with the octave doubled up, and more rarely inverted with the fifth below the root. That's a favorite of Richie Blackmore. <laughs> but they're all fundamentally the same thing. However, a power chord is voiced when a guitarist is playing a power chord riff, and let's just stick with the most cliched example that everyone will definitely know, Smoke on the Water. What they're doing is simply 
playing a big old parallel moving harmony with all the voices in the chord moving together. This breaks a bunch of supposed voice leading rules and is completely lacking in anything we might call subtlety or sophistication. Both massively overrated things in my opinion, but that is at least in part the point. And if you add in a major or a minor third, they're no longer power chords. There's nothing wrong with adding in a third, but at that point it just isn't a power chord. It might be a triad or it might be a bar chord, but it's not a power chord. Lacking that third means that a single power chord all by itself won't really set up any specific tonality and that alone can be very useful. It's common in rock music to hear a soloist take advantage of that fact by switching between parallel, major and minor when soloing over a power chord. Anyway, let's look at the history of this magical chord. The power chord saw its first recognisably modern use in electric blues recordings of the middle of the 20th century and were further popularised a little bit in rock and roll. Power chords really came into their own though when British bands just started using them all the goddamn time. Although root fifth chords on many instruments and in many genres had been used plenty of times beforehand, what sets their rock era electric guitar use is, well, again, just how much rock musicians went on to use them, but also just the simple necessity of their use. Put simply, as blues, rock and roll and early rock bands turned their amps louder and louder, these go to 11. Their playing became more and more overdriven and distorted. At first, power chords really were just about working within the technical limitations of playing loud without sounding like crap. You see, harmonically richer chords don't work that well when distorted. I'm sure every bedroom guitarist has noticed this. Even just adding in a major or worse yet, a minor third to a sufficiently distorted power chord can be enough to muddy up the sound to the point of just unpleasant dissonance. <laughs> And extensions beyond that are even worse. You know, your ninths, elevenths, flat thirteenths. You gotta be really careful to starting these chords. And the thing is, by the time rock and roll and early rock music came about, jazz musicians had been playing complex extended chords, major, minor, and dominant, seventh and ninth, as well as the entire world of altered chords and other extensions. They'd been playing these as a simple matter of course for a good few decades at least. Blues musicians similarly had also been using plenty of extended harmonies in their music for ages, again, sevenths and ninths, sixths too. And then classical music, well obviously classical music had been in the complex harmonies game for longer still. But those types of chords simply won't work through an overdriven guitar. I mean, they sometimes do. <laughs> But you have to be careful, and they mostly don't. So, from a harmonic point of view, power chords really are a massive simplification of what was already being played in popular genres of the early and mid 20th century, but a necessary one given the realities of amp distortion. So, to sum it up a little bit so far, in the 50s and 60s, if you wanted the volume up high on your electric guitar amp, which of course people did, you had to deal with at least a little bit of distortion. And that distortion just gets in the way of those richer harmonies beyond the root and the fifth by making them sound nasty. So guitarists simply simplified the chords. And in the process of simplifying, they got addicted to these power chords. A lot of early amp manufacturers would actually specifically boast how little their amps would overdrive and distort even at higher volumes. Guitarists at the time mostly wanted to avoid that sound rather than lean into it precisely because those richer chords that were so popular lost definition so much when overdriven. This anti-distortion attitude feels a little bit alien today of course given how important distortion is to an electric guitar player's sound. Like, 
why would you want an amp that never distorts? But that's just because musicians, rock guitarists in particular, quickly realize how freaking awesome it could sound and so accepted and then embraced the necessity for simpler but distorted chords. You see, beyond being simply necessary, power chords actually sound especially awesome distorted for a reason. I'm not gonna go super deep into this, but the gist is that every note you hear from an instrument, unless it's a pure sine wave, every instrument is actually a combination of pitches. These other pitches are the partials and the harmonics that give each instrument their unique timbre. It's why a flute sounds different to a banjo, sounds different to a guitar, sounds different to a violin. Uh, if you distort a note, additional partials are generated while the ones that are already there are amplified, and this sort of thickens the sound simply because there is more sound now. As I've already said, this can become a problem when chords include thirds, sevenths, and frankly anything beyond the root and the fifth, because all the added frequencies start to clash, sometimes a lot. But when you just have the root and fifth, the resulting sound is simply a thicker, richer, more powerful sound, thanks to the creation of new fundamental frequencies in the chord. It's really very cool, and I think most people instinctively understand that. It's something that just hits you in the gut. I just think they're neat. Anyway, this all just goes to show how something that arises from simple necessity can end up becoming a strong cultural or generic norm. It happens all the time in loads of things, not just music. It happens in, for example, food. Many, if not most, traditional recipes across the world are actually the result of necessity rather than solely what tastes best, whatever that might mean. By that, I mean that the result of cooking with the ingredients and techniques available, but that same necessity can end up setting expectations for the norm. People all over the world will insist that there's a very specific right and wrong way to cook certain dishes or ingredients, and they'll get offended when others don't think the same way. Talk to any Italian about how to eat pizza and what to serve with it, pineapples, for example. Uh, there isn't really any right or wrong though. It's all just convention, usually based on what has historically been available and people latch onto that. So, as I said before, power chord riffs would be frowned upon if you were trying to compose something according to common practice rules of voice leading, but, well, who cares what those nerds think, but also, that attitude arose in its own specific context where being able to hear independent voices in large reverby spaces, say in a church, was very important and necessitated stricter voice leading rules. If rock musicians had followed that classical norm strictly, they wouldn't have struck gold with their distorted power chord riffs. I mean, they didn't even know about the rules, so they wouldn't have to follow anyway. So, though those riffs are very simple compared to harmonies and a lot of other genres, again, they just sound very cool and there's nothing more important than that, at least in rock music. Anyway, it didn't take long for these distorted power chords to become a standard, actually the standard, almost universal part of rock vocabulary. As early as 1964, Dave Davies of the Kinks was not just okay with distorting amps, but actively damaging his amps in order to get that sound. Even today, you really got me and all day and all of the night sound impressively punchy I think and they stand out from most songs released around that time in terms of sheer attitude and it's all down to that guitar sound oh and also we mustn't forget one simple straightforward indisputable fact and that is that power chords are just really easy to play on guitars this always helps, and this is important. It's not just a trivial thing. As I've said, all genres are on some level the result of working within the realms of what is possible and practical, i.e. reality. And the reality is that rock music was, and to a large extent still is, actually something of an outsider art form. Now, of course, it feels wrong to call rock a pure outsider art form as a whole because it's so commercially oriented as a genre, but it's certainly outside of the academy, largely made by untrained or unschooled musicians working out how to play what they want without actually knowing what they're doing at all. I think rock music as a whole, and some other popular genres fit into this as well, like hip hop, they really do fit the definition of outsider art to a larger extent than many might assume at first. The first wave of rock music was made almost invariably by self-made amateurs, each trying to fill a range of roles, writing lyrics, playing instruments, writing songs, singing, performing, producing, rather than the much more technically proficient and usually much more specialized musicians that made up even rock and 
and roll bands from just a decade before or country bands. Uh, never mind what you'd find in jazz and classical. Like, take someone like Danny Gatton. He was a phenomenal guitar player who mainly played country and jazz. <laughs> Honestly, he was better than virtually any rock musician of his generation, but he was just a guitar player and he spent most of his career as a session musician or covering others compositions. I know what you're thinking though, and you're right, rock musicians themselves might not be formally trained most of the time, but a lot of early and contemporary rock musicians definitely did get help from more formally educated musicians. George Martin working with the Beatles, for example, but still, the broader point stands, rock musicians themselves are actually more often than not misfits and weirdos working on the peripheries of Western music. And that's why we love them. Ultimately, the reality is simply that rock musicians are mostly not all that technically gifted in the grand scheme of things. Historically, this has largely been a result of having to teach themselves how to play music. And because of this, any shortcut is great to them. Step in power chords. Power chords are that shortcut for a lot of rock musicians. Most rock musicians, certainly all rock guitar players. The very fact that you can pick up a guitar, very quickly learn how to play power chords and be writing original songs within a week or so was and is hugely important to rock music and isn't too dissimilar to today's rap scene where anyone can easily get going with some recording software, sample some beats and just start making music without having to, say, buy an expensive instrument or go through a few years of practice and learning or anything else time consuming or expensive. So I spent a bit longer talking about just power chords than I expected and I've covered some of the ground in the next few sections already but the point is power chords are very important to rock music. Very, very important. But, and this is my last point on this, there are plenty of bands that quite obviously rock but for whom power chords aren't really that important at all. The Doors, The Smiths, The Talking Heads, even bands like Creedence Clearwater Revival, heck, even The Beatles. I think if you took all the power chords out of those bands' music, and they really don't appear that much, I think if you took them all out, we'd still think of them as rock bands. I mean, we could argue in a way that some of these bands are less rock, if we wanted to. None of them are the heaviest rock bands in the world. They're probably not necessarily the group of most archetypal classic rock bands, but they're still definitely rock. Hmm. So let's move on now and look at the other characteristics. Next one is loudness. Loud. Yeah. The power chords and the whole band need to be loud. Yeah, can you have everything louder than everything else? Right. I actually covered this a little bit when discussing power chords, when I talked about the development of rock music and power chords alongside increasing band volume. But there's a little bit more to it than that. Rock music isn't just loud. Rock music needs to be loud. It's a defining characteristic. The Beatles played loud when you could hear them over the screaming. Led Zepp were loud. Hair metal bands were all loud. Pantera, loud. Slayer, loud. Santana, loud. Oasis, loud. Heck, even Toto were loud. Rock musicians so famously end up with hearing loss and or tinnitus at relatively young ages so often precisely because they always play so loud. But... Rock music is of course not uniquely loud. Classical musicians also suffer from a lot of hearing damage due to the sheer volume of orchestras. Jazz musicians too. Rap, funk, electronic music, all plenty loud. But rock music was probably the first truly, completely amplified and electrified popular genre. And it was the first to turn ear-shatteringly high volume into a quality worth seeking in and of itself. It was also arguably the first to so fully embrace not just volume, but noise, at least in a commercially viable, accessible to the masses way. Musicians have, of course, always been interested in non-musical noise, but it was only with the kind of rebellious youth culture of rock music that being loud and noisy, with no requirement for finesse or subtlety or justification, became valuable in its own right. But are there any rock bands that aren't or weren't loud? Well, we could sit here and think of songs that are played by rock bands that we'd still call rock songs which aren't particularly loud or noisy. Maybe we'd include songs like Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles. Here comes the sun. Here 
comes the sun. A lot of the studio stuff of Dire Straits, All the Grateful Dead. Your eyes looked from your mother's face. Pretty much anything on Fleetwood Mac's rumours. I don't think of this music as loud rock necessarily. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow, no. But also, don't we already have a word for this sort of quiet rock? Don't we tend to just call it soft rock? Which, okay, isn't the exact same as quiet rock, but I think is implicitly actually maybe exactly the same thing. And given that a lot of people do think of soft rock as less rock, I think that sort of supports my argument here. I think the general perception is that soft rock is less rock, precisely in part because it is quieter and less noisy. It's like rock music without the rock, because to rock is to be loud. Now, I'm not necessarily endorsing the idea that soft rock is less rock, but I do think this sort of dynamic is at play a little bit. Anyway, like I just said, it's not like rock music is uniquely loud. Being loud is valued in all genres to some extent, I guess, maybe except you could argue certain types of ambient, certain types of folk, but most music is better loud. Uh, and I think all genres have loudness as some part of their tradition somewhere. So whether that's the orchestral crescendos of a classical piece, 1920s jazz bands trying to play over the noises of dancing audience members, or a punk band blasting their amps in their parents' garage. I might just be better off saying that each genre has its own approach to playing loud, and rock is no exception. But I do think that rock's approach to volume is unique. Maybe not totally unique today, but in its historical context. It's what I said earlier, volume and noise are valued in and of themselves in rock. And that means they're just, they need no justification. Asking why rock bands play loud and like noise, it's like asking why jazz musicians love chord substitutions and like to improvise, or why classical musicians love melodic variation and development. Why do rappers sample other songs? These questions can be answered, of course, by looking at the context in which those genres arose, but ultimately it's just what those genres do and asking for justification would be kind of borderline nonsensical. I'm simply saying then that rock music mostly has the same relationship to sheer volume and noise, particularly noise made by guitars, that those other genres do to their stylistic tropes and vocabulary. <laughs> mm. So, the guitar. I think that we all get that rock music and the guitar, specifically the electric guitar, and even more specifically Les Pauls and Fender Stratocasters, are almost completely synonymous as far as the general layperson is concerned. Like, rock music is guitar and guitar music is rock. Honestly, I'm not even sure if I need to go into much detail here, it feels kind of self-evident, so I'll keep this a little bit shorter. So, firstly then, uh, rock music isn't the only genre that uses electric guitar, obviously. Uh, that's not the point. Jazz uses plenty of electric guitar, reggae, funk, blues, even plenty of pop and R&B. But no other genre has been or is as obsessed with electric guitar as rock. Why is that? Well, like anything, there are going to be loads of reasons, but the one I want to briefly highlight is what I hinted at earlier. Guitars are accessible and relatively inexpensive. More so than, say, pianos, which are huge and expensive, or violins, which take a lot of practice to get good at and can, again, be quite expensive. And they're very versatile. Not only can it double up as a lead and melodic instrument and as a rhythm instrument in accompaniment, you can also quite simply buy an acoustic guitar, learn that for a bit, and if you feel like it, move on to electric, and a lot of the same skills will be easily transferable. And that is precisely what most, if not all, of rock music's first generation of guitar players did. They were poor, largely self-taught musicians who could only at first afford to buy an acoustic instrument. In some cases, they even had to make their own. But the important thing here is that they could start their musical journey easily and cheaply, and then could quickly begin to emulate the music they heard on the radio, which used electrified versions of what they had. That's a large part of the founding myth of rock music, and it hasn't gone away entirely. So the only really important question I want to tackle here is, is the electric guitar necessary for rock music? Does it cease to be rock without the electric guitar? I would have to say no, but almost. Like, there are rock bands without electric guitar. Here's a nice list on Rate Your Music, and here's another list on Ultimate Guitar. But I mean, let's listen to some random examples. There's a reason you've not heard of these bands. The 
I know that sounds really snarky, but it's not meant as an insult. It's just that they're hardly the sort of commercially oriented music that gets popular. To play rock without electric guitar is, in the first place, a bit of a niche or even contrarian move. It's certainly unconventional, and so it's no surprise that the music made by these bands is also a little bit off the beaten track. And dare I say it, those bands do definitely feel maybe not less rock, but less obviously rock. I also suspect that rock bands without any electric guitar are going to be the type of rock band wanting to consciously work against the typical expectations of the genre around the instrument and will likely diverge from typical rock tropes in other ways anyway. Anyway, other instruments can actually stand in for electric guitar and bring exactly what we need to the music to make it rock. So the most obvious guitar substitute is going to be the keyboard in all its variegated glory. I'm talking about everything here from Moogs to Hammond organs, even acoustic pianos. There are plenty of great moments in rock where instead of electric guitar, we have a keyboard instrument filling a similar role. Let's start with a little example. It's just a moment really, and it's John Lord's Hammond organ filling in for Richie Blackmore's riffing on Smoke on the Water on Deep Purple's Made in Japan album. Richie is soloing away with John Lord filling in the rhythm on his Hammond. This is already a decent example given that he's occupying a similar role to a rhythm guitarist, but it's at the very end of the guitar solo where Lord ramps up the distortion and switches to the classic Smoke on the Water riff, and it sounds exactly like a distorted electric guitar. Have a listen. A more complete example where the keys do the guitarist job for an entire song is Emerson Lake and Palmer's Living Sin. Honestly, a lot of Emerson Lake and Palmer's music could be used as an example, and there are other progressive rock tunes by other bands, but we'll stick to this one. Maybe not the best song in the world, but it's a good demonstration of what I'm talking about here. Anyway, I think that there's Hammond and a Moog on this track. I don't know, there's a few synthy things going on here. But the point is, the riffs and fills that Emerson is playing on this track are dirty, noisy, distorted, dissonant, a bit bluesy, and clearly working as a bit of an electric guitar analogue. So, we get it, right? The electric guitar is important to rock music, and a rock band that doesn't have any, maybe it is a little bit less rock. But what about other instruments? What about bass? What about vocals, drumming? Are these as vital to the rock sound as electric guitar? Hmm. So... I think that the bass guitar is important, of course, and rock bass is certainly its own thing, its own style. But I honestly don't think the bass guitar is amongst the most important rock instruments, and no, I will not elaborate further. I think vocal style is more important than bass. A rock singer sounds like a rock singer, and I think it's a style unto itself, but I actually think it's the last of these, drumming, that is most important to defining the rock sound alongside guitar. And it's hard to fully explain why that is. It's probably gonna come down to that old volume and noise thing though. Again, this is just another thing that isn't rock specific. Drum kits are obviously used in plenty of genres. So all I'm saying is that I think rock drumming is a bigger part of the rock sound than anything other than the electric guitar. You can take away the singing from a rock song and it's still rock music. Uh, you take out the bass playing, and I still think it's a rock song. You can remove the keys if it has any, or any other instrument, remove all that. Sometimes you can even remove the guitar, but without rock drumming, rock music sounds like it's lacking something very important. Or, to put it the other way around, imagine adding rock drumming to something that isn't rock. Beyond just ruining whatever you've added it to, I reckon it'd have much the same impact as adding electric guitar into something that isn't rock, i.e. It might not turn it into rock, but it gets you halfway there. It's a huge part, for example, of what separates folk music from folk rock, and it's a large part of why an acoustic punk band will still sound like a punk band as long as they have rock drumming. I also reckon this is in part why something like Pet Sounds very much isn't rock, but the Beatles of the same time are. Put aside the lack of prominent electric guitar on the Beach Boys album, there's also just something deeply unrock about the way that Hal Blaine approaches drumming and percussion on Pet Sounds, and something very clearly rock and roll about Ringo's drumming. Even on a song like Here, There and Everywhere, not exactly a hard rocking tune. Hey. Even on that track, Ringo is playing the drum kit as a drum kit, like a rock drummer. And what's the heaviest tune on Pet Sounds? Maybe I'm Waiting for the Day, you know, the song that opens with classical timpani and is completely percussionless throughout the verses and large bits of the chorus. Yeah, that one.
I know there's an answer and I just wasn't made for these times are the only other two songs that approach a rock feel. And again, they both have very unorthodox percussion compared to what you would find on a Beatles album. That's not to say any approach is better or worse, just different. And they really help situate the two albums in different but very closely related genres. So we have power chords played loudly on electric guitar and finally through an amp. And again, I've actually already covered this a lot in the previous bit, given that loud and distorted inherently include the fact that the guitar is amplified, but it's worth talking about a little bit more, if only because this whole amplified bit also entails the use of effects pedals, from wah to chorus to flange, overdrive pedals, tremolo, Leslie speakers, delay, pitch shifters, and many more. Rock music, again, certainly isn't the only genre that uses these sounds, but it's where a lot of them came from, it's amongst the genre that uses them the most, and these effects are, I think, still most associated with rock musicians and rock music. <laughs> In terms of guitar culture broadly, it really is only the rock guitarists who obsess so much over their timbre or tone. Not saying that tone isn't important to jazz guys or folk guys or whatever, but rock guitarists have made it their thing to an unprecedented degree. In rock music, tone is elevated to the point of having its own language and subculture. Some of that might be a bit unproductive and a bit silly, like go on any guitar forum and say that the wood a guitar is made out of makes no difference to the tone, or better yet, say that the tone is or isn't in the fingers and see how quickly a guitar civil war starts. Again, to some degree it's silly, but to some degree it's actually something really quite special and unique and downright awesome about rock music. As a rock guitarist, you're specifically meant to find your own tone. It's a big part of your individual identity as a rock musician. And there's no real set expectations in rock music on what your tone needs to be. Then there's no real right or wrong. And that's actually something quite remarkable. Okay, so there are often general sub sub genre expectations like you're unlikely to play a metal gig with a Mark Knopfler tone and you can't be playing a blues rock gig with I don't know the tone of Kerry King but even there you probably could do either of those plenty of metal musicians do use those cleaner tones at points sub genre generic expectations with regard to timbre are obviously there and of course important but those expectations are very broad very inconsistent very personal and frankly anarchic which is a good thing and i do think maybe not entirely but like quite unique to rock music anyway this is now starting to touch on some of the things that i'll be exploring in much more detail in part two which is coming out soon i hope in that one, I will talk about broader generic values and characteristics and examine the most important question yet. Is rock dead? Anyway, this video is now done. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Farewell, and please remember to like this video and please subscribe. Please, for the love of God, subscribe. I just want to hit a thousand subs. Please, just let me get there.